Hi, I'm John Gregg, the news editor at the Valley News. Welcome to Valley News Digest. This is our second episode in our collaboration with the nice people here at CATV in downtown White River Junction. For those of you who are new to the Upper Valley, we are the Daily Paper based in West Lebanon. We cover Grafton and Sullivan counties in New Hampshire, Windsor and Orange counties in Vermont, and statewide issues in both states. Uh, the states are a little different in some ways, so it's a lot of fun. Um, but also, of course, the Upper Valley is a fairly coherent place, and we hope to contribute to that. Um, we are also on the web, of course, at vnews.com, so you can always read us there. Uh, we're in the heart of fall, taping this just as we're going into November, and so we're going to talk about three things today. Uh, a new school in an old mill town in Vermont, and we're going to talk about Dartmouth football, which isn't something that people talk about every year, but there's stuff to talk about this year on that. And just a little bit, I promise not too much, but we're going to talk about the elections. And so first, uh, joining us first is reporter Matt Hongoltz-Hetling, who has uh, been writing about Hartford for our paper for four years and the environment. He recently had a story that let us know that there are even jellyfish in the Twin States. <laughs> um, but he's also been doing a series of stories about uh, it, related to education in Vermont and uh, Act 46. So Matt, you've been spending a fair amount of time in Bethel, Vermont, along with our chief photographer, Jennifer Houck. Tell me what, uh, what's taken you there. Uh, well, a lot of people are paying attention uh, to Bethel right now because it is the site of the White River Valley Middle School, uh, which is a new school that was created uh, by the communities of Royalton and Bethel uh, to comply with Act 46. Uh, Act 46 was very controversial. Uh, a lot of people felt like uh, it was not going to fulfill its promises of equity and affordability and improved opportunity for students. Um, uh, but a lot of people feel like, you know, no, this is the only way to bring down the education costs in Vermont and, and the way to go. Uh, so a lot of people are looking at Bethel to uh, find out if this new merged middle school is going to succeed. And if it succeeds, a lot of people are going to point to that as evidence of the act's effectiveness. Uh, and if it fails, a lot of people are going to say, see, I told you so. Yeah. And this is grades, uh, what, fifth through eighth? That's uh, sixth through eighth. Sixth through eighth. And what's happening in high school? The, and it, the, the, in Bethel, they're going at the site of the old Bethel School and Whitcomb High School. Is that correct? That, that's right. It's where Whitcomb uh, used to be. Uh, it's in that same building. And uh, the two communities did a lot of hand-wringing to determine whether or not they were going to do that. One of the selling points of the proposal was that both uh, schools, both facilities, would remain a vibrant part of their community. And so they solved that problem by saying, we're going to have a true middle school in Bethel uh, for six through eight, and uh, the high schoolers will go to Royalton. Right. You were there for the first day of school. That, is that one of the things they're trying to balance? What are they trying to balance here? Well, you know, they're, they're trying to balance all of the demands under the law. Uh, which is a long list, uh, and they're also trying to balance the expectations and traditions of two different communities and cultures. Uh, and so that is uh, difficult. You know, it comes down to very small details. They have a trophy case in, in the lobby, as, as many schools do, and that trophy case has trophies that represent a lot of victories for Bethel. So do you keep those there uh, because it's nice for them to have that tradition, or uh, do you recognize that, hey, a lot of those successes in the trophy case came at the expense of Royalton, and now you have Royalton students there. Uh, so, you know, there, there, there are things to work out. Sure. Um, it, it, how are the students enjoying it? Are they as concerned about this sort of thing? Yeah, I think if there was a, a time when the antagonism between the communities and, and the bad taste of the debate over the merger uh, could adversely impact the student culture, I think that danger is largely passed. You know, I talk, I've talked to dozens of students at this point. Uh, every single one of them told me that they feel very welcomed by their peers, that they have an opportunity to make new friends. Uh, when they have problems or issues with the school, it's not because of that culture, it's because, you know, the lockers are smaller. Uh, than what they used to be uh, in Royalton. Or, you know, the library, the lighting uh, feels more like a classroom and less like that cozy kind of library atmosphere. Yeah. Uh, about a month ago, <clears throat> about a month ago, you visited a shop class in, in Bethel. What did you find? Yeah, no, that, that was really cool. Uh, 
it, this shop class is an example of a new program uh, that the merge district is able to offer. Uh, and so uh, they're building this program from the ground up, you know, very literally. Uh, it's located in an old storage shed. The kids are, you know, beyond thrilled to get their hands on these new toys and new tools. Uh, and they are taking on real life projects that can actually help the school as a whole. And they feel that, you know, they, they sense that it, it's uh, an opportunity to do something that matters in their classroom. And so their first project is they're building a new storage shed to house the equipment that they've displaced. Yeah. Oh, great, yeah. great. And uh, what are some of the challenges? I mean, I think transportation might be one. Are they saving money? Is that an issue? Oh yeah, everything is not working. Um, <laughs> tra transportation is at the top of the list uh, of uh, concerns for a lot of people. Uh, I was talking to a mother uh, the other day who told me that there are some kids in Bethel who are being picked up at their homes or near their homes, uh, taken to the South Royalton School, transferring to another bus, and then coming back, driving past their homes to get to school in Bethel. Uh, so there are some issues that have to be worked out. Uh, it's a work in progress, and it's not being helped at all by the fact that there's a regional staffing shortages, uh, staffing shortage for uh, bus drivers. Yeah, and, because and of the economy, lots of school districts are having trouble finding bus drivers. Right, yeah. right. So it's hard to kind of parse out, well, what's, what's uh, a problem because they have this bigger, more complex, geographically far-flung district, and what's simply because, uh, you know, uh, for an unrelated factor of a staffing shortage. Yeah. yeah. And um, are they saving money, or is it hard to know yet, and are they meeting other benchmarks? Well, you know, uh, the superintendent's been reluctant to publicly discuss the finances uh, until uh, everything is set uh, through, through an audit that uh, just recently wrapped up. And I kind of take that reluctance to mean that it's not a particularly rosy picture. Um, I think a lot of critics are going to point to it and say, you haven't uh, seen the savings that you promised. Uh, the tax rate has gone up. You said that it would stay the same or go down. And I think a lot of the proponents of the merger are going to counter with, uh, it would have been even worse had we not merged. That all, we, we had some adverse financial impacts uh, that happened on a statewide uh, level and that were beyond our control. Sure. And uh, earlier you said sort of half in jest, nothing is working. I mean, to be clear, <laughs> there isn't widespread dissatisfaction <laughs> oh, or anything yeah, here, no. right? And, and and one of the goals also is to is to offer more uh, educational opportunities for these students, right? Isn't that one of the things? Yeah, they're yeah, for? absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that there, there's there's uh, a lot of new education happening. Uh, you have a merger of two district staffs and. Uh, the most important thing that a school does is teach our kids, right? Yeah. Uh, and so a lot of the measures of how well a school does that uh, are, you know, graduation rates and test scores and how uh, successfully they enter the workforce in college. We don't have any of those measures yet. Uh, so right now we can only kind of uh, guess based on what we see. And what I've seen so far is that the administrator, the, the local principal there, Owen Bradley, uh, and a core teaching staff see this as a golden opportunity. It's like an educator's dream to build a program from the ground up, and they are seizing that opportunity, and they're treating it with such uh, respect and enthusiasm uh, that while we can't say anything for sure, I, I really like their chances. Yeah, well, that's good to hear. And you're working on a story now about curriculum that's going to run sh soon in the Valley News. What's uh, tell us a little bit about that? That's right. That's right. Yeah. So it's it's basically you know kind of delving into that. You know, what is how is the classroom experience changed for students? Um, and what are the contributing factors to a successful classroom experience? And so I, I've talked to some of these teachers that I mentioned, and they are uh, learning from each other uh, and coordinating in ways that they haven't been able to do before because they've been in these kind of like isolated smaller blocks. And, and so now they're really having an opportunity. They have planned time to like coordinate a curriculum that is very particular to a middle school. Uh, and this has been a debate in uh, the United States for decades. You know, is a K to 12 model better for the students? Uh, is it, you know, uh, better to have six to 12 maybe? And a lot of people say, no, a middle school 
specific experience is the best possible model, and that's now what they have for the first time, and so they're trying to roll with that. Yep, great. Well, we'll yeah. be following it, um, and thank you for telling us about this. Um, happily for Matt, not so happily for us at the Valley News and some <laughs> of our readers, uh, Matt did a, a fabulous freelance story for an online magazine about bears and libertarians in mm. Grafton, and lo and behold, it won him a book contract. So he's actually <laughs> going to be leaving the paper uh, this month in November uh, to work on that, but he's still going to be around the Upper Valley. And thank you very much for all the great stories and also telling <laughs> us about this. Thank you, John. I, I hope I still have some opportunity to get some freelance bylines in there. All right. We hope so. All right. And joining us next is going to be Greg Fennell, our sports editor. Hi, my name is Grace Collins. This is my third video that I've made on the merger at the White River Valley Middle School. Today we are talking about two things, extracurricular activities and technology, meaning um, with the extracurricular, if there's any clubs going on, any new ones, anything that I'm a part of, anything that I want to start. But we're joined now by sports editor Greg Fennell uh, from the Valley News. A uh, little mindless trivia. Uh, Greg and I were born a day apart way back when John F. Kennedy was still president in suburban uh, Washington, D.C. We grew up in the Maryland suburbs. We were both Washington Redskins fans, mm -hmm. rooting for the likes of Larry Brown and Sonny Jurgensen and Billy Kilmer and Joe Gibbs and John Riggins. Mm -hmm. And now we're going to talk uh, football here in the Upper Valley. Uh, Greg, there's a lot of excitement around Memorial Field in Hanover. Uh, what can you tell us about Dartmouth football this year? Well, it's been maybe a little bit of a surprise season so far. They did have a very good one last year, 8-2 and two record. They were in the league conversation for championships. But at the start of this season, I don't think a lot of people were expecting a whole lot out of the Big Green. Preseason poll in the Ivy League had them sixth out of eight, yet here we are at the time of this taping going into probably one of the most anticipated Dartmouth football games we've had in a couple of years. Big Green going down to Princeton, Dartmouth nationally ranked, Princeton nationally ranked, both up in the top 10, top 20 in a lot of statistical categories. And the big thing is two undefeated teams in the league haven't played against each other this late in a very long time, so it could have a big say in who wins the Ivy League championship this year. Right, they're both 7-0, mm -hmm. and and I think I fell out of my chair when I saw that Dartmouth is ranked 20th nationally. Mm -hmm. That's pretty unusual, Yeah, right? the most recent poll has them at 20th. Princeton actually moved up three spots from 17 to 14. Uh, we could talk about that a little bit later, uh, about what's gotten them to that point, but it's not something that happens every day. That is true. Ivy League teams don't get a lot of respect at the football championship series subdivision level because they aren't allowed to play in the postseason, so it's kind of an afterthought if you see one there. Maybe one makes it into the top 25 at the end of the season. Very rarely is there two. Yeah. Um, Beating Dar Harvard, which Dartmouth did over homecoming weekend the last uh, oct uh, weekend in October, that was a big deal, right? Oh, yeah, always is. Uh, I hadn't realized it until we saw some of the pregame notes that Dartmouth hadn't beaten Harvard in 15 years. Um, last year, three-point loss in a game that they led down in Cambridge actually had a big say in Dartmouth finishing second in the league as opposed to a share of first. So knowing what was ahead, the Princeton game ahead, knowing they needed to get that victory last week against Harvard was uh, – uh, crucial for, for Dartmouth to continue the successful run. Yeah. Our Dartmouth sports reporter, Tris Wikes, has been writing a lot about the team, of course. Mm -hmm. They have a little bit of an unusual situation going on with quarterback, right? Yeah, it is. It, I kind of liken it to a pitcher who has a very good fastball and can come back with a real good changeup. The quarterback situation has been kind of interesting the past couple of years. Two, three years ago, we had Dalen Williams, the, uh, the dual threat quarterback. He could run, he could throw, pretty much do everything, and that led Dartmouth to its last league championship. They had Jack Hennigan, who was more of a pure passer, he graduated, got a little bit of time in the San Francisco 49ers training camp this year, but there was a question mark about who was going to fill in as the true quarterback. They've had Jared Gerbino since last year. He's a 220-something pound bulldozer who runs out of uh, a run formation, wildcat formation, where pretty much you're telling everybody, we're going to snap it to this guy, you've got to stop him. But who is going to be the guy to throw the football, because Jared's not a particularly good thrower. So the big story through preseason training was who was going to be the next Jack Hennigan. And it turned out to be a sophomore by the name of Derek Kyler, who hadn't seen a varsity snap yet in his career. Now we're seven games into the season, and he's the top-ranked passer in the country in terms of passing efficiency. He's done the job quite well. Yeah. And do they have any standouts, especially I think there's someone in de on defense, right? Yeah, Isaiah Swan has had uh, a fantastic season at cornerback. He continues to lead the country in interceptions per game, seven 
picks in seven games. Obviously a very good percentage. Doesn't hurt when you get three of them in the first game of the season, but he's also returned one for a touchdown. And it's not just him. While I can't sit here and name names in every position on the field, Dartmouth has a very good defense, a very physical defense, and that has also played a major role in the success they've had this season. Yeah. Uh, the head coach, Buddy Tevens, a Dartmouth alumnus, he's been there for a while now. Mm -hmm. He's drawn national attention uh, for his work on avoiding concussions. Tell us uh, what he implemented and how that's going over. Well, a couple of years ago, he got to work with a group of people from the engineering school, from the Thayer Engineering School, and developed something called the Mobile Virtual Player. It is a tackling dummy on wheels, so to speak. It can be run uh, on automatic control or remote control. It's, I think, roughly about 200 pounds, so it, it simulates the size of an average college football player, and it helps the big green in, uh, in tackling exercises. So they don't have to go around hitting each other four or five times a week and then go out and hit somebody else in a football game and in theory reduces the possibility of injury and certainly the, the big thing, the possibility of concussion. Does it work? I think it's still some evidence out to be, to be gathered on this, but if you want to take something really circumstantial, I guess you could say, for, for the purposes of the Princeton game, Dartmouth is in very healthy condition right now. Very few significant injuries on this roster. Most recently, a couple of weeks ago, a game down at Columbia, nine players from the Lions had to be carried off the field or helped off the field for injuries against Dartmouth. So it tells you, I think, two things. One, Dartmouth is a very physical football team, and two, that they're healthier because they're not beating up on each other in practice. Yeah. Well, you, know, you draw the conclusions from that. Sure. Well, there's some big games ahead, as you said. At least one of them is going to be in Hanover. Are they an easy ticket? Yeah, I think so, yeah. I mean, last week, uh, Harvard was a game that could very easily have sold out had the weather not been as miserable as it was. They probably only filled about half of Memorial Field. Uh, most games will get between three and 5,000, maybe more. Harvard and Yale till tend to be the ones that draw the biggest. One home game left in the season. It's Brown. It's the end of the year. Brown will probably be last place in the league or one of the last couple of teams in the league. And it could be a game that will decide whether Dartmouth gets the Ivy League championship. Forget not that even if they do lose this Princeton contest, there's still potential to win a shared championship or even an outright if something happens to Princeton. But Princeton's been playing so well this season, I find it very hard that they'll drop off the map. Yeah, well, if, they, uh, if the winning continues from the Dartmouth team, people can throw on their thermal underwear and wool hat <laughs> and sit in the stands and watch, watch one game at home. I, I know that I'm a casual fan, and I've, I've done that occasionally, and it's, uh, it's fun to watch some good football. In all honesty, I think if you did that for the Brown game, you'd probably be more comfortable than you were if you went to the Harvard game the other day. Yeah, all right. Well, thank you, Greg. Uh, for joining us. Uh, finally, as I promised, this is election season and we've got lots of local races that we've been watching at the Valley News. Uh, there are governor's races in both Vermont and New Hampshire. Uh, in, in Vermont, uh, Republican incumbent Phil Scott is being challenged by Democrat Christine Hallquist. Uh, we'll see how that sugars out. Um, in New Hampshire, uh, Republican Governor Chris Sununu, a first term uh, incumbent, has been ahead in polls but it'll be interesting to see if what's expected to be a strong Democratic turnout really helps uh, Molly Kelly, who's challenging him. Um, on the local level, there's an interesting sheriff's race in Grafton County, uh, pitting the longtime Republican incumbent Doug Dutile against uh, a Jeff Stiegler, the police chief in Bradford, Vermont, who happens to live in Grafton County. Um, I wrote a story about the Windsor Senate District that represents all of Windsor County and two other towns. There are three Democrats uh, who are holding that, but they've got a full slate of Republican challengers against them and an independent. It'll be interesting to see whether the big uh, gun safety legislation that two of the Democrats voted for and uh, Phil Scott signed uh, comes into play there. And then in the White River Valley, there's an interesting house race in the district that represents Tunbridge and Royalton. Uh, the state representative, David Ainsworth, a Republican one, and one of the few dairy farmers in the Vermont legislature is being challenged by Tunbridge selectman John O'Brien, uh, the filmmaker who's well known in the Upper Valley. And um, that has uh, always been a very close district. David Ainsworth won that seat by two votes uh, two years ago. So we'll see. Those are among the many races that, that we'll be following. And we hope that you'll be following the Valley News both in print on our website and then watching these shows along the way. Thanks for joining us.